Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to embark upon a, a week filled with philosophy of dark matter with you all, especially in a beautiful city like this. Um, and as Enzo indeed said, nobody's going to be happy if I'm going to talk for two hours straight. So please interrupt me uh, as much as you would like. Um, so I think each of the speakers is speaking, or at least I'm speaking three times this week. These are the topics. So today it will be an introduction to the philosophy of dark matter. Um, and I will also be talking about modified gravity uh, for better or worse. Uh, the topic of the second lecture will be a, a specific separate topic. And then the third lecture is two further separate topics, dark matter realism and theoretical virtues, or in particular, uh, explanatory power of dark matter and modified gravity. Um, so yeah, today, three parts. First, uh, since this is the first lecture, I'll go through the history or a history of dark matter and also a history of the alternative modified gravity, MOND. Um, then the second part will be an overview of philosophical questions of these fields. Um, and then the third part will be talking a bit about a way of framing the next two lectures. I think they're interesting intrinsically, but you can also, they're also part of a bigger, bigger story about trying to understand the relationship between the dark matter communities and the modified gravity communities, and especially why this relationship isn't uh, particularly great. Um, so those are the three things I'll be talking about. And I'll be starting with the history of dark matter. And if you open a physics textbook, then usually often it will say 1930s, Zwicky discovered dark matter. That's how long dark matter has been around. Uh, that's probably a bit too simplistic and not fully accurate. Uh, so what I'll do here in the first part of the talk is tell the history or a history of dark matter as it's been told by uh, Jakob de Swart and his colleagues. So they're historians of um, physics. And that story is going to be a bit more, a uh, bit more subtle. Um, okay, still so starts uh, with uh, Zwicky and soon after a few others who in the 30s looked at uh, galaxy clusters, right? And there on the one end, they determined the mass in the visible way. You look at all the matter in the galaxy cluster, and then you have models of uh, what these stars and galaxies are like. And based on the ones you see and how much mass you think all of them have, you calculate the mass of the whole galaxy cluster. Um, but there's also another way of trying to determine it, a dynamical way, uh, where basically you assume that uh, Newtonian gravity is applicable, and that these clusters are in dynamical equilibrium. And then you can apply something called the virial theorem, um, which connects the mass that's in there with all the velocities of the galaxies within the clusters. And so you can also uh, calculate uh, the mass, right? And it turns out that the dynamical mass is much, much larger than the physical mass. So it's as if these galaxies are pulling much more, uh, are attracting each other much more than you would expect based purely on the uh, visible or the mass of the visible um, matter. Now, dark matter is mentioned as one of the possible explanations for this, but that doesn't necessarily mean the dark matter we, we talk about nowadays, right? This could just be kind of dim stars, right? things that are very hard to see, right? Because I didn't, don't think anyone in the 30s thought, oh, we have now with our telescopes right now, we have seen everything there's to see in the universe, right? So it was not a very radical thing necessarily to say, okay, well, there's some matter we haven't seen, we need to keep looking, keep improving our technology. And uh, yeah, so this was not some revolutionary um, moment necessarily. Yeah, there might be uh, dark matter in one form or another. Um, yeah. And then indeed, so 1958, Amrit Sumyan says, oh, maybe there's actually an alternative explanation for what we see going on there. Maybe it's just not the case that these galaxy clusters are in dynamical equilibrium, so we can't even apply the virial theorem, we can't even calculate the mass in this way. Uh, maybe it's just the case that these clusters aren't stable at all. Um, maybe that's an explanation, we don't need dark matter at all. And indeed, until the late, uh, sorry, until the very early 70s, um, actually both of these options were seen as problematic. So there were many, many different options on the table, including changing the laws of uh, gravity. And there wasn't really a consensus one way uh, or another. Uh, this basically wasn't enough. There weren't enough theoretical and uh, observation constraints to really pin down one preferred solution that everyone could agree on. So that was part one of the story. The second part uh, of the story um, is uh, around the 1970s. 
the galactic uh, rotation curves, right? So these are graphs where you plot the velocity of the parts of the galaxy as a function of the radius. Um, Freeman, Rubin, and Ford looked at this, and this is an, well, this is one of the galactic, uh, the rotation curves of one of the galaxies. Um, and normally what you would expect if you see all the visible matter in a galaxy, that at some point the rotation curve is going to uh, go down. And that's not exactly what they saw, or at least uh, that's how they phrased it. And it seemed like they were saying um, the rotation curves are kind of flat. I mean, of course, not fully flat, but you see here, it's kind of uh, flattening. But again, it was not like, oh, oh, this moment in time, we've definitely seen dark matter, right? There is, uh, it really kind of depends on some matter of taste, depending on how you fit this. Here they used the five, fifth order polynomial, here fourth order. Who knows what's going to happen here? Right, so it kind of really depends on how you're going to fit this, and it's not like, bam, dark matter, uh, we've got it um, necessarily. But still, it's it's a part of an important part of the story. Third part of the story is um, the cosmologists. So it's somewhere in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, data astronomical data kept improving, especially with respect to quasars and the cosmic microwave background. Uh, the steady state theory became unpopular and there was a renaissance of GR, so the relativistic, uh, relativistic cosmology and uh, the relativists finally uh, had their time to shine. Um, also, at least in the US, there was less and less funding for the Cold War at some point. So the American physicists had to do something and many of them moved into astronomy departments. So there we kind of start getting a mix, a blurring of physicists, cosmologists, um, and astronomers. And um, some phrases are saying that around this time, cosmology became quantitative or physical. And one of the central questions there was, what is the fate of our, uh, of our universe? Uh, it's a question whether the universe is flat, open, or closed. And at that point, it was uh, thought this depends on two values, the Hubble constant, which they thought was known at the time, and the deceler deceleration parameter, we basically need to combine the cosmological constant, which at that point they thought was zero, and the density of all the matter um, in the universe. So it suddenly becomes very important to know how much mass is in the universe to see how what the, the, the eventual fate of the universe is. Um, and here there was um, not so much an empirical preference, but very much a kind of philosophical a priori preference, prejudice, aesthetic um, yeah, preference that uh, there should be much more mass than we see because they wanted enough mass uh, to close the universe. Uh, yeah, so and the problem is we don't actually see that. So if you want the universe to, to evolve in that way, somehow we need to find more mass, right? So this is very much kind of a philosophical, some some cases because it was kind of a machine inspiration. Anyway, there was a very different reasons, um, kind of theoretical, extra empirical, uh, for why there should be more mass, if you would ask a cosmologist back then, uh, than we seem to observe. So again, uh, another wish or another suggestion that there might be more mass than uh, than we than we see. Um, there was a third part of the story, and there's a fourth part of the story, and uh, that's in the late uh, '60s. It started to become possible to simulate galaxies uh, on a computer. Um, and they were trying to simulate this galaxy and see how it would behave, it would be uh, stable. And the ones you see in the sky seem to be rotationally supported. So the parts of the galaxy right, the, go around and the angular momentum counterbalances the gravitational force. Um, they tried to simulate such disk galaxies and initially indeed see like a little bar, which you also see if you, uh, from many galaxies if you look at the sky. But then within just a few rotations, all these galaxies become very unstable. They just uh, become unstable, and instead of nice rotationally supported galaxies, becomes a hot blob of pressure with particles moving in all uh, kind of directions. Um, so in a computer, you couldn't get stable disk galaxies, even though we do seem um, to see them on the sky. And then in 1973, Ostriker and Peebles realized that if you say, well, there's also a spherical component, not just a disk, but you say there's also a spherical component to the matter, then actually that is one way to stabilize your galaxies in the computer. But of course we weren't seeing such empirical uh, halos. Uh, so yeah, that's not really gonna solve your empirical problem, um, but 
it's uh, yeah, this is one way to solve it uh, on your computer. Um, so these are four part of the stories, and what the Swart and colleagues point out that it's it's not that we just have evidence for dark matter and it keeps increasing and increasing, right? So it's not the case, or at least they argue, and I think I would agree with them that around the time uh, of Swicky, it was like, oh, maybe like uh, around that time, astronomers had a 25% degree of belief that there was dark matter. And then 1970s, oh, 50, 50%. And then uh, at some point, okay, now we are really certain. It was also not really the case like, oh, around Swicky's time, 25% uh, of the community was certain there was dark matter. And then when we get uh, the rotation curves, oh, now all of a sudden half of the community is certain, right? No, that's not how it went. There were just all these different suggestions, but in all these contexts, there were just loads of different alternative possibilities. So it was not in any of these contexts that anyone was necessarily really certain that it had to be dark matter. But then in 1974, all these kind of things um, come together. And there are two important papers by Peebles, Ostraker, and Yahil, and by the group in Estonia. Uh, and I realized, well, we can solve all these problems in one go if we, if we assume there's dark matter. And now all of a sudden, you kind of have a unification, all these separate problems. And now it seems, OK. Now bring this all together. If you just if you think there's dark matter, this will kill four birds with one stone, albeit an invisible one. Um, and Jakob Swart and colleagues argue that this is if you want to pinpoint a moment in time. I'm not sure that's necessarily a thing we would want to do, but if you want to, they would say 1974. That's when it all came together. That's where you can unify all these separate contexts and the separate problems, um, unify them. Um, with a single solution, dark matter. Okay. Um, later in time, uh, other pieces of evidence uh, appeared. Right, many of you will be familiar with gravitational lensing. So, if you have a, where are we? We're on the right side. Um, if you look at a distant object and there's matter in between, then light will be um, curved by the mass here in between. Um, and then, it seems if there's here a cluster or a galaxy cluster in between that the curvature of the curving is more strongly than you would expect is based on the visible matter. So one way of explaining that is by saying, oh, maybe there's more matter in between there, which acts like a stronger lens than you would have thought. Uh, so uh, many would interpret that as a evidence for there being also dark matter here in the middle. Um, then the bullet cluster in 2004, often presented as the smoking gun. Um, Right, so what's going on there is we actually have two clusters, uh, which, well, the story even goes that they pass through each other. Um, right, so a cluster on this side and on this side, um, and the stars, which you can see here. And here, this kind of pass through without a lot of um, um, interaction. Um, however, the gas, so the pink stuff, which the pink stuff is measured in x-rays, seems to lag behind because when they pass through, there's a lot of... Um, um, electromagnetic interaction. But then if you're going to use gravitational lensing to figure out where a lot of the mass is in there, then it turns out that much of the mass is actually here. So not where the, the gas is, but uh, it seems like most of the mass is actually passed through mostly unhindered uh, as opposed to the, the pink stuff, the gas. And I would say, well, that must mean that there's a lot of dark matter that passes through because dark matter is dark. It doesn't interact electromagnetically, uh, only a little bit of gravitational interaction. Uh, so they would say, yeah, blue stuff, stars, and the dark matter, pink stuff, right, clearly separated in space, uh, is the gas. So this um, is supposed to be prime evidence for uh, dark matter. And slightly around that same time, you also get arguments uh, at the larger scale from structure formation, um, right, where the idea is in the early universe, if you have density, little density fluctuations, gravity can start working and clumping them together, creating more and more structure. Um, however, around that time, every time you have a proton and a neutron, uh, proton and electron recombining, there will be a photon that knocks it out again. Uh, there's uh, equilibri equilibrium. As any time you think you might have a little piece of structure that's developing, it's gonna be washed out until the, what is it, 300, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And finally, um, the photons decouple and then only then, if you would have normal, only normal matter and normal gravity, only then can the little density fluctuations start clumping together. But if it happens only then, then by now we wouldn't have the structure uh, we see, right? Planets, we wouldn't yet exist in 14 billion years, wouldn't be enough time. 
So somehow that process needs to speed up. Now, if you have dark matter, then actually it can go much faster because dark matter is not going to be bothered by these photons. So it can start clumping together much easier, uh, much quicker. And with dark matter, you can actually simulate evolution of structure formation in the universe and get something right now that looks like what we actually see right now. And this you can then, and the way you, uh, the signature of this is if you look at the cosmic microwave background, the angular power spectrum, this will give you a strong prediction for the relative height of the second and the third peak. Uh, so an argument or evidence from the larger scale, the cosmological scale, for why we should have uh, dark matter. And then nowadays, this lambda CDM, called the standard model of cosmology, right, where only 5% is the ordinary matter we know and love. A big chunk is dark matter, and an even bigger chunk is dark energy, although that's not the topic of the school, so I won't say much about it. Um, okay, so that's the kind of the, the positive story so far, the positive history of uh, dark matter, um, but it also faces a few problems. Um, the big elephant in the room is, of course, well, these were all astronomical, cosmological observables, but what's the microstructure? Is it a particle? Is it a black hole? Is it fuzzy dark matter? Is it something else altogether? Loads of options, uh, loads of attempts to find the dark matter particle, if it's a particle, um, haven't yet found it. So um, there are a few ways of trying to detect it, uh, three main ways, depending on how you read uh, this figure. So from left to right, what we try to do in colliders, like at the LHC is you have two uh, bits of normal matter, two, par two normal par particles collide, and then you hope dark matter comes out. And of course you can see it, it's dark, but there would then be missing energy in your collider and you can hope to uh, produce your own dark matter um, in your backyard, kind of. Um, the other direction, indirect um, detection, is if you read the figure from right to left. So if dark matter particles would annihilate in the sky, they can turn into um, particles from the standard model, and we might be able to observe those. And then the third option is direct detection going from uh, the bottom uh, to up. If you would have a normal, uh, say, in um, tank with xenon and you have a dark matter particle that uh, recoils with the nucleus, you can hope to measure that recoil and so um, detect dark matter in that way. Um, so many of the other lectures are going to talk about that, so I won't say much here, except of, of course, the the, the public secret that we haven't yet seen uh, a dark matter particle or not uh, not one that everyone would agree on at least. Um, yes, and this leads to many, many, uh, there's still many, many particles and other micro uh, constituents of dark matter on the table. These are kind of just a few of them. Um, what's interesting here, some would say, which makes it a lot of fun, others would say, uh, uh, makes things quite desperate is that um, well, there are loads of options and they have different masses and there's a range of magnitude, 90 orders of magnitudes between the heaviest ones, the heaviest black holes and the lightest fuzzy dark matter particles. So there's a lot of room for a theorist to play with. And of course, for an experimentalist, there are many, many uh, corners of parameter space where you uh, might want to look. And uh, yeah, here's a comic, uh, a cartoon version of uh, the many, many, perhaps way too many options that are still on the table. Okay. Um, I was hesitating when I should show you this survey because it's, uh, you should really take it with a grain of salt. But if you're not familiar with the field, it might be good to get a bit of a feel of like, uh, which are the popular candidates, which are not the popular candidates. Um, so two years ago, we organized the philosophy of dark matter workshop with, uh, and we asked the people when they registered, which, candidates they thought were still on the table, were still viable. Uh, we had 121 responses. Um, and so, you know, so these were some of the options uh, on there. Uh, take it with a grain of salt. Half of, the, half of the participants were physicists and over half identified as philosophers or historians, sociologists. Uh, so of course, not really representative of the whole population of people working on dark matter. And of course, various topics, uh, of course, the topics of the workshop will also determine who shows up. Uh, but so you see some, of course, familiar candidates like the weekly interactive massive particles, the WIMPs, uh, which used to be very popular, but are getting a bit into trouble. So actions are kind of uh, becoming more and more popular. Lots of interesting physics um, there. Uh, primordial black holes tend to kind of be more fashionable in, a, in and out of fashion. 
more kind of in waves. Uh, that's how it goes. And Francesca will talk about those. So I won't spend uh, much time of them. Um, I'll come back to this figure in a bit. Um, let me move on to a few other um, problems for the dark matter hypothesis. Um, these occur at the small scale, which means the scale of the galaxies uh, uh, in this context. Um, they actually, yeah. Uh, so some of these problems have gotten a name, but basically what they boil down to is when you try to simulate structure formation, right? In computer, you try to evolve the universe forwards, including dark matter, and see uh, what happens. And that leads to several problems. One of them is the cusp core problem um, that you would expect the profile of the. Um, can I draw here? Yes. Um, right, that the, in the inside of galaxies, that the, it would be cuspy, the density would be quite high, but what we actually observe is that it's more of a core here. And it's, yeah, so typically we get things like this in the computer. And what we see is more things like uh, that. Um, the second one is missing satellite problem. In the simulations, you often get loads of satellite galaxies, dwarf galaxies, etc., uh, around galaxies like the Milky Way galaxy. Um, we don't see them, they're missing. If simulations are right and somehow we're not seeing them. Um, so you might say, well, what if they're just fully dark matter? They're dark, we can't see them. That's, of course, the trick the dark matter advocate can uh, often use. However, then you run into the third problem that some of these missing satellites are just so big. If they will be fully dark matter, it would basically be impossible for them to not have attracted some luminous matter so that we, in principle, should be able to see them. And another problem is the diversity problem. Um, where um, we see kind of lots of different distributed different types of dark matter, galaxies, halos, uh, but in these simulations, you actually get dark matter galaxies which look quite a lot like one another. They're not at all as diverse as the ones we see in the wild. Um, okay, so how to proceed in light of these small scale challenges? Uh, should we just jump the dark, uh, right? Uh, stop with the dark matter paradigm? maybe modify it a bit or just keep going the way we were. And uh, that's what Siska and a colleague Nora um, have written a very nice paper on and Siska will discuss this in her third lecture. Um, so I'll leave that to her. Um, then there are some other problems or challenges, that's uh, to use a more neutral word. Um, Happening at the same scale, but they are not officially part of the small scale challenges, basically because they're, you'll see in a second, are more often uh, brought forward by uh, modified gravity people. But anyway, these are also problems happening or challenges um, at the um, galactic scale, so the small scale, relatively speaking. And what they all boil down to is that there seems to be a very tight connection between the visible matter we see at galaxies and the dark matter if there's indeed dark matter. And if there's indeed dark matter, you wouldn't always expect dark matter can do it at once to some extent. Um, so it's quite surprising that there would be such a tight connection. So let me explain. One of these is often called Renzo's rule, um, right? So when you see a galactic rotation curve and you see, um, um, well, features of the, um, uh, your normal luminous visible baryonic matter, and then look at the total curve, um, including the dark matter. Then whenever you see a bump in the visible matter, these, these qualitative features are basically also there in the full thing, right? Whereas this is supposed to be kind of the sum of the dark matter contribution and the visible contribution. And uh, right, there can be quite a lot of dark matter. So it would be surprising if the features that are there in the visible matter would also always appear in the sum or the, the sum, the com combination of these two. Um, another thing is the baryonic tully fisher relationship, which is relationship, for instance, in galaxies where the mass of the galaxy is related to uh, the rotational velocity, the maximum rotational velocity, right? So it's kind of here, the highest, the highest point. And if you uh, plot all these galaxies, you get a certain relationship. And it turns out that this exponent is very, uh, very exactly uh, four. And in Lambda CDM, you wouldn't, I mean, it's possible, but you wouldn't necessarily um, expect that, or it doesn't have to be like that. 
And then there's also an MDAR, the mass discrepancy acceleration uh, relation, which is the picture you see here on the right. Um, so what's plotted here on the, this side is the, uh, the little g, right? So on Earth, 9.81 9 meters per second squared uh, on Earth. Um, um, yeah, so the one for the baryonic matter, so the normal matter, the visible matter, luminous matter, the non-dark matter, whatever you prefer to call it. Um, and here you see the little g that's actually um, uh, the one we, uh, the actual one, the one we observe. And if Newtonian gravity was the case, you would just see a straight line, right? That this would be the same. But now it turns out that uh, at low accelerations, uh, there's actually, it seems like the gravitational pull is much stronger and can kind of this very much quite a neat correlation. In astronomy, things tend to be quite messy, but actually here we see a very, very neat uh, correlation going away from what you would expect in Newtonian gravity. Um, uh, right, so that's why uh, very interesting. Why does an acceleration scale pop up and why is it so, so tight, right? Why is this galactic uh, correlation? Uh, seems like there might actually be zero scatter. The only scatter you see might be um, not there in nature, but just because of the way we measure. And then there are a bunch of other ones uh, which are less often mentioned. Um, then let me mention one or two more problems or challenges, interesting features uh, at the galactic scale. Um, but here the data is, is much newer and not, not as uh, straightforward, uh, but it seems to be the case um, that um, if a galaxy is in a background uh, gravitational field, let's say it's there's some galaxy cluster on something very massive, uh, which gives a background gravitational field, the stronger that background field, uh, the less dark matter you would expect in that galaxy. And again, if, if dark matter is just its own thing, right? It's kind of independent from visible matter, you would expect it to kind of do whatever it wants uh, to some extent. Um, so it would be surprising within the Lambda CDM framework why there seems to be some connection here uh, going on. And I'll get back to that in a sec. Um, another problem. Um, dynamical friction, uh, of course, now typically normal friction happens with contact forces. I mean, there are no real contact forces in, in, in nature, but you know what I mean, right? This is the contact uh, friction. Um, but if there are dark matter uh, halos in all galaxies, right? If there are lots of dark matter particles everywhere, you would also, uh, then if a star moves through it or some object moves through it, you would expect, you would expect something called dynamical friction, right? So if here, uh, this object is moving through it here, then gravitationally it will attract the dark matter particles. And once the thing is passed, they will have moved slightly more uh, towards this bit, right? So there will here be an over density of dark matter particles. So kind of, and uh, so in the wake of this object, uh, there will be an over density, which will create a, a drag force, right? There will be more particles here than the uniform distribution overall. So it will be pulled back a little bit as if it experienced friction, although kind of the friction comes from behind rather than uh, from the front. So if there's dark matter particles everywhere, then you would expect to see this uh, and it seems like we're not seeing it. Uh, so why are we not seeing it? Okay, I've been talking for quite a while. Any questions so far about this history of dark matter? Okay. Is it true that uh, when we only the order of magnitude that matter in the galaxy station. The, the, the idea was correct, the calculation was correct, but the, the Hubble constant had, had a value that in the search for a little different from now. So you make a normal mistake in the order of magnitude, or it's a relevant. The reason it was correct, but the calculation was two order magnitude bigger than the real one. Sorry, for, for which calculation? The equation of the quantity of that matter in this galaxy, I don't remember the name. I think I've also heard this myth, but I, I'm afraid I also don't know. If it's, it's, I don't know if any of the physicists. Okay. So you, you got the wrong Essentially, tuning the, the thing to the 
local universe, which is not really dominated by this functional regulator. So I would say it would Great. Any other questions? Yeah, I was just curious to know, but maybe I got it quite wrong. Um, you are considering here in the case of statistics, you present all variable matter to be uh, within the set of uh, visible matter, right? Uh, so, so with which specific? Uh, where? So because we uh, have variable matter Um, yes, yes. So it's a very good point. So the, uh, and I think Siska will also talk about different concepts of dark matter and I'll raise this also in the second part of the talk. We use the term dark matter all the time, but it can indeed mean different uh, things. Um, for instance, we have found dark matter or neutrinos are dark matter. Um, so in that sense, we have found a form of dark matter. It's, we've known for it uh, quite a while, but um, that by itself is not going to account for all these things. We also know that there's loads of objects, dim stars, etc., which are dark matter in the sense that it's not really visible, luminous, or for instance, luminous matter. Uh, so that's all there. But um, that, if you put all the neutrinos you can, make them as heavy as you can, given the constraints, um, put in reasonable estimates of all the stars we have not yet seen because they're too dim. Um, so that would be a sort of dark matter. Then you would still need much, much more. And that is what we typically talk about now when we, when we say the dark matter. Um, uh, yeah, but for instance, that's what I was trying to say when Zwicky was talking about, oh, there's unseen matter. That doesn't mean, oh, it's, it's non-baryonic dark matter. It's just like, we haven't seen all the matter. I mean, that's not that big of a surprise. Who would have thought that we had seen all the matter? I mean, that would be very, uh, well, not very uh, humble, of course. Um, so yeah, so uh, when I think most of the time when I've been using dark matter now, except for I want to talk about Swicky. It's like we need on top of the dark matter, the, the unseen matter we are aware of, or neutrinos, we need something extra. Um, and those are also the candidates I showed here, right? We need something more, and that's called the dark matter or dark matter with capital letters, or whatever. Yeah. So all these things play a role. Um, but the argument is we would also need the, the non baryonic stuff or, the, or, yeah, or black holes or whatever, but more. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and honest. Well, so yeah, I wish Francesca was here, but she was, I mean, I imagine she might talk about it. Well, I mean, what really is only going on here is that something uh, moves, uh, this object moves through and then it gravitationally attracts all the things that are here. So I imagine if there were some black holes there, I mean, they should also, so I guess anything that has mass or feels the gravitational attraction in some sense, it should work, I think. Uh, but, but it might be different. I mean, the, the strength of the effect might differ on the type of thing you're looking at. But I think, um, People like Papa Koopa work on this, and I think there they're talking more about standard and kind of whims or actions, the, your your run of the mill dark matter particle. But yeah, we should ask Francesca this. I would expect it to some extent to occur for all all dark matter candidates, but I I can't tell you the numbers uh, if it's yeah. Any other questions? Okay, um, then we'll move on for now. Um, so what we've been assuming in this whole history up till now is that, right, we saw if you have standard gravity, sometimes Einstein, sometimes you only need Newton, uh, plus the visible matter, 
then you're going to run in loads loads of problems, right? The the, the behavior you see the 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 way uh, galaxies etc move and uh, constituents of galaxies move is not as you would expect. These two things are not going to give you the right solution, so you need to change one. And what typically we assume, well, we all, well, many of us love GR and uh, Newtonian limit. So typically we assume, well, this must be right. Let's put in exactly the round amount of dark matter everywhere such that we can uh, still stick to uh, GR. Of course, it's dark. You can put it, uh, it's very easy to put it in loads of, hey, hello, in um, loads of spots and uh, rescue GR if that's what you're going for, right? So, um, now, of course, if you have an independent way of, um, well, okay, I'll come back to that in a sec. So what typically is done is, is one assumes that GR is universally applicable, even though we've kind of only independently tested at the scale of uh, stellar systems uh, without independently testing it in exactly the regimes we're looking at here. And of course, if someone would say, well, the solution is to actually modify this side, um, then you would be kind of begging the question if you insist now we're going to keep the side and adding dark matter, right? If you don't have an independent test of gravity, I mean, you can go for that route, but at least prima facie, you should also consider uh, or allow other people to consider uh, the other route. So what's often, uh, often brought up in this context is the two case studies of Neptune and Falcon. Um, so initially, when there were some discrepancies in how uh, planets in our solar system um, behaved, uh, it was realized that if we postulate an extra planet uh, at a certain location, certain mass, that, that uh, can solve all, solve all these discrepancies. And indeed, Neptune was predicted and also uh, found. Uh, yay, we can stick to our laws of gravity, in that case, Newtonian gravity, postulate more matter, and you can save your, save your laws. So then later, when the anomalous perihelion precession of Mercury appeared, right, another discrepancy of how, how things were moving around. Again, the idea was Le Verrier thought, okay, I can postulate that there's again a planet we haven't yet seen and tell you where it's on the sky, how much mass it has. Let's go and look there with telescopes. And it turns out in that case, that wasn't going to work. And we actually needed Einstein to come along with general relativity and we needed to change the laws of gravity to solve the problem then, right? So in some cases, postulating more matter and sticking to, with your laws, is going to work. In other cases, you need to change um, the laws. And this connects to many kind of topics which philosophers like to think about, um, right? You can see there's an instance of Duhem problem. If, if you know that this combination, standard gravity and physical matter, is not going to work, all you know is that one of the two is wrong. You don't know which one, right? So you have kind of a, a holism. It's very hard to, or in some cases, it can be hard to confirm these things independently. You only know that together they don't work, um, right? This leads to questions of underdetermination. Do we hear if the data is the data such that it determines which of these two theoretical options is the right way? And if so, often in the case of underdetermination, people, physicists and philosophers bring in theoretical virtues. They might say, well, okay, empirical data doesn't tell you it's this or this option. So maybe we should go for the most simple one or the most accurate one or the one that's most fruitful in some other way. Um, so basically what's going on here is what uh, Bill Vandenberg calls the dark matter um, double bind, so let me explain, right? So it's, well, it's basically what I said on the previous slide. If we had an independent way of determining how much uh, mass and matter there was, and then you can apply the laws of gravity, see how they behave and see if they behave, move as quickly as you would expect based on the mass. If that all agrees with one another, you might say, okay, now we have kind of good reason to believe that we know how much visible matter there is and what the laws of gravity um, are. But to the extent that we think we have in the way, independent ways of determining the mass, like by the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the theories of stellar evolution, you can try to guess whenever you see star how much it should, uh, what the mass should be, and you can add it up. And then we see, well, we actually have an estimate that's 10 to 100 times uh, too small. So now the independent way we have of getting at the mass gives us the wrong answer. So then how to go from there? And that's what uh, Bill says. We're basically in this dark matter double bind. So let me read it out. He says, in order to evaluate the empirical adequacy of any gravitation theory at galactic and greater scales, the mass distribution in dynamical systems at those scales must first be known. So ideally you want to know the mass and apply the laws of gravity and figure out how the mass behaves. So you can see if your predictions are borne out by observation. But because of the astrophysical dynamical discrepancy, the mass distribution is not known. 
in order to infer the mass distribution from the observed motions, a gravitational law must be assumed. But, but we cannot assume such a law leg legitimately since the very thing at issue is exactly which gravitational law ought to be taken to apply at galactic and greater scales, right? So basically you want to know the mass then you can apply gravity to figure out how the dynamics, how things behave. But to know the mass, you kind of want to know the laws of gravity first, but to know the laws of gravity, you kind of want to know the mass and where you're going to start. It's kind of, you keep going in a circle. Uh, so that's what he called the dark matter double bind. And he says, or he said two decades ago, um, perhaps the only way, or the way to solve this would be the detection of a dark matter particle, but that's exactly what we have not yet done. Or maybe indeed uh, bring in some theoretical verges, which you can say, well, empirically we can decide, but let's decide some other way. Uh, if you can read up on that in this paper, if you would like. Um, so basically all this is to say that at least prima facie, one uh, should consider or allow others to consider the other option of modifying the laws of gravity instead, rather than postulating matter that we can't see and put it everywhere where it needs to be to correct for any discrepancy you bump into. Um, this is called modified Newtonian dynamics or MONT. Um, now you can try to modify your laws of gravity in many ways. Uh, you might think maybe gravity is different, stronger or weaker uh, when your astronomical, your celestial body or astronomical entity, galaxy, whatever, it's a specific size. Maybe just at large scales, gravity is weaker or stronger. Um, turns out that's not gonna, that doesn't work out empirically. Maybe at different velocity, maybe if a galaxy is moving very fast, very fast relative to something, uh, maybe then gravity changes. Again, that's not gonna solve these problems, but it turns out that, um, right, I've mentioned this acceleration scale earlier when I mentioned the NDAR. It turns out that one uh, way that does seem to uh, be successful to some extent, it's to modify Newton's law of universal gravitation uh, based uh, um, as a function of accelerations. So basically what this law is saying, so right, normally this would be the normal law. Uh, and I'm saying we have this extra factor here. If your acceleration is much, much larger than a zero, which is now a new fundamental constant of nature, the dimension of acceleration, if it's much larger, this factor mu will just be one. We just have standard Newtonian regime, which we all are used to. But if um, the acceleration is much smaller than this new scale, then actually the mu is uh, A over A zero, which will mean that the force um, in such systems will be actually stronger. So gravity is enhanced stronger uh, in systems where the characteristic accelerations are uh, very, very small, where small means relative to uh, this, uh, this number. And this number comes from observations, right? They tried different skills, and this seems to be the number that keeps popping up for all the galaxies you try to apply this formula uh, to. Actually, let me check. Yeah, is there any questions about Mont or well, this formula? I understood. But in this case, it's very small, uh, the combinator is smaller, and so the, the, the fading of the, the gravity is uh, slower. Decrease, yes, if the, the point is the last. Sorry, if the distance is when the, the, <clears throat> when the distance is the very small, the uh, denominator of the force became smaller, and so uh, the fading of the gravity, the, the decreasing of the gravity was the, uh, much lower for a small distance. This is the point. Of no. this formula. No, so the modification is not as a function of distance. If you would compare two particles in Newtonian physics at a certain distance, and you compare the two other particles which are living in a Mondian world at the same distance, then they will experience a stronger gravitational interaction. Of course, you can also vary R here, but um, the point is that A varies. Yeah, any more questions about Mond? I mean, we'll keep going on about Mond for a bit, but about the, this, the basics of MONT, yeah. Okay, um, yes, so that, that's MONT, uh, how successful is it? Um, well, to the extent that it is, it is at the small scale, so the galactic scale, right? With the rotation, rotation curves, it turns out if you feed in the, 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 the visible matter, uh, its velocities, et cetera, um, well, if, no, if you feed in the, the matter, this formula 
uh, will spit out the galaxy rotation curve using only this one parameter, A0. It's, doesn't matter how many galaxies you're looking at, only always one parameter stays the same, universal parameter. And then it does actually very well at predicting, uh, well, it gives you a unique prediction for what the galaxy rotation curve should be. And it basically get the answer right most of the time. And um, right, whereas for um, the dark matter case, you have a dark matter halo for each galaxy, which is two parameters, and these parameters differ per galaxy. So for if you look at 100 galaxies, you only need 200 parameters in principle, whereas for MONS, you use one. Uh, so MONS kind of really goes out on the limb. It gives you one unique prediction for the galaxy rotation curve of each galaxy. And most of the time, not always, but most of the time, it does quite well. Um, and it also gives quite unique predictions of other aspects of galactic uh, observations. That Renzo's rule, right? If you have a feature here, well, for Mont, there is no dark matter. It will just tell you, you give this as input and it will tell you the total uh, rotation curve. It's not really surprising if there's a feature here, it will also be there in the total feature because for Mont, people, there is nothing. I mean, there's no matter beyond the matter that you're given as input. And then the slope of the Tully Fisher relationship. Remember, there was a relationship between matter and the maximum velocity here. Uh, to the power fourth, it will tell you it must be, right? You can just derive it. It must be to the power fourth. And it turns out that's also what we observe. Um, then the MDAR, right? Where we saw uh, this acceleration scale well, was exactly what's, what's going on with MONS at the small acceleration below 10 to the minus 10 uh, meter per second square. Um, the, right, okay, I'll, I'll just go back. Right, so indeed you see here that this is how gravity would go. It was Newtonian. And here at small accelerations, you actually see that the observed acceleration is so uh, the gravitational force is um, uh, stronger than you would expect in Newtonian. Yeah, yeah. So they, yeah, good question. So they, um, I mean, in all of the, all of the the galactic relations they look at. They try to figure out what is. So they've they, first they've done it with a standard value, and then afterwards they've allowed to vary it. And it turned out that uh, you don't actually increase your fit with the data by allowing a zero to to vary. So yeah, not yeah. So they all kind of give this. It's not yeah. It's not uh, not an input. You can get it out of it, and it doesn't. You don't gain anything by not taking it to be constant. Yeah. So it's for and then you. You can check for all these different types of accelerator correlations what the acceleration scale is, and it always comes back to the same A0. Well, that's what the Monians claim, or the observational astronomers claim, some of which uh, advocate Mont. Um, okay, so where was I? Yes, um, and so, uh, well, and of course, dynamical friction will be dynamical friction from dark matter particles uh, being in your wake. Well, there are no dark matter particles. If this theory is right, so there will be, you expect no dynamical friction, uh, which is what we also don't seem to observe. So, yay. Um, what about uh, simulating these galaxies uh, um, in your laptop? Um, well, we said, well, if you just have a disk galaxy, then it's going to be unstable. You can solve that by adding a spherical component, which you can see, so it must be dark. Turns out uh, you can also just run the disk galaxy simulations still being a disk, but then use MONT instead of Newtonian dynamics. And this will make it as stable as uh, by adding the dark matter halo of a specific size. Um, so the claim is that you can also solve that problem within MONT. And then we get back to the external field effect. Um, right? So what, again, I don't think the data here is very conclusive, but it's seems to be like there's a hint that if your galaxy is in a strong background gravitational field, the stronger it is, the less dark matter you would expect in that galaxy if dark matter is a thing. Um, well, in the Monian case, that's exactly what you would expect, right? That would be predicted here because what matters there is, um, uh, right, normally in Newtonian physics, you can look at a galaxy, uh, ignore the rest of the universe, uh, calculate how what everything is going to, how everything is going to behave. And then if it turns out, oh, actually, it was in a background gravitational field. Well, as long as the gravitational fields over the like the, the size of the system, say the solar system you're looking at, as long as it's 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 uh, uniform, you can kind of ignore it, right? You can you can add that uniform acceleration to everything, but that won't 
turn the, the, the one changed in terms of dynamics, right? So it's linear, you can superimpose these things um, uh, um, normally, but for Mont, that's not, so that is the famous corollary six of Newton's Principia, um, but that's not going to work for Mont because there what, what the absolute acceleration is, is going to matter. Uh, so if you would have um, uh, a solar system, whatever, something um, where the characteristic accelerations are far below a zero, then you would get Monian effects. You would see stronger, uh, a stronger gravitational pull than you would expect uh, from Newton. And then you can calculate how these things are going to behave, right? Uh, the planets. But if you would then, um, uh, then say, okay, now we're going to take into account that's actually in some background gravitational field from a galaxy or a galaxy cluster, then suddenly, well, if the acceleration of all these components of your solar system is much uh, larger than you thought that it was, then suddenly you're not in the Mont regime anymore, or you can, it can be if they're large enough that you're now far above A0, you won't get any money in effects, which and kind of from the dark matter perspective would mean you don't see, you don't need any dark matter, right? You don't need to modify anything compared to uh, Newton. So in the Monian framework, it's exactly what you would expect. If you're in a regime where if you take into account all the relevant accelerations, you're far above A0, you wouldn't expect real deviations from Newtonian physics. If on the other hand, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So here in the Monian case, it makes a lot of sense. Of course, in dark matter case, it's surprising that somehow it'll, whether there's a galaxy cluster somewhere in the background will change how much dark matter there is or not. Or at least Alanda CDM has to tell a story there, right? Where, whereas uh, Mond tells you exactly what's going to happen. And it seems tentatively as if the data agrees with that, but the judges are uh, still out. Okay. Um, so these were some of the successes of modified gravity, all at the small scale. Uh, but there are also very serious problems for uh, this research program. Um, like, of course, MOND is not the whole story, right? It's not a relativistic theory. Even if GR is wrong, we're going to need relativity. You need some extension, some relativistic extension. These typically get quite complicated and typically just don't really tell you anything at a cosmological scale. Doing structure formation with these theories tends to be impossible, at least in practice, or or don't give you the right answer or yeah. So cosmology is really not their strong suit, but even at the intermediate scale of galaxy clusters, uh, to the extent that these theories do tell you what's gonna happen there, the effect is actually too weak. They often still need to add dark matter. And if the whole point was to avoid dark matter and then you say, well, okay, we still need loads of extra dark matter in galaxy clusters, then I might say, well, that's, uh, that's not great. And then what about the bullet cluster, right? The idea there would be, well, if Mont or some metaphysic extension is correct, then you would expect, so here is all the gas. You would expect that when you um, measure the supposed dark matter, that in the Mondian case, it would be exactly at the same uh, same location because all phantom dark matter is for Mondians is just where your normal matter is, this kind of a bump in the in the gravitational interaction. So then just even forget about quantitative results. Just qualitatively speaking, it would be really weird that, um, yeah, that the supposed dark matter is here and uh, the, the gas is all there. That's very hard to account for in months. So um, I think some authors have claimed like, um, uh, if you try to model this with uh, Tevis or some metaphysic extension of Mont, getting getting the effect here away from the location of the matter is like an eight sigma deviation. So it's very, very bad. Um, the Monians tend to respond well, but forget about, yeah, if you're going to look at how likely it is that you would find a cluster like this within lambda cdm it turns out you know the, this there's a big uh, very the shock front here because the velocities here are very high that's the shape is why it's called the bullet cluster uh, the monies will say well we have simulated this within lambda cdm it turns out getting a galaxy like this is very unlikely there's also an eight sigma uh, this only only happens at the eight sigma so again um, this seems to be a problem for everyone they would claim you wouldn't expect a galaxy like this at all. So to then draw conclusions from, oh, there's a dark matter, et cetera, et cetera. They would say, if you tell a story here about uh, the shock front, was it 3000 kilometers per, well, I forget the value, but they would say there's something going wrong here anyway. So we can't really um, conclude anything from this. I'll leave it to you to decide if that's uh, satisfying or not, but that's one of their typical responses. Okay, so to sum up uh, some long histories, 
dark matter, we've seen the four problems, which then in 1974 kind of all came together and were unified, thinking, okay, we can solve them all if we now uh, postulate dark matter. In the 80s, we have the standard CDM model um, without dark energy, and then in the 50s, dark energy is added. And from the 80s onwards, you get loads of particle physicists involved to come up with all the WIMPs, actions, etc. Uh, we've seen the Buddha cluster and the baryonic acoustic accelerations, right? The structure formation. Um, and where we are today is lots of successes. We still don't have the dark matter particle. We only have indirect evidence for dark matter via gravity, which of course, if you try to decide between modified gravity and dark matter, it would be great if you can have something that doesn't depend on gravity. And we have all these small scale challenges. And on the Mond side, so it started much later, Mond 1983 with Mornay Milgram, Moti Milgram. Then of course, I mean, nobody there thought like this is the, the, uh, the final theory. We need some relativistic extensions. Several were proposed in the kind of the, the flagship uh, theory. The, the favorite one was Tevis, tensor vector scalar theory, right? So whereas in GR, you have one metric, uh, one metric field, here you add an extra vector field and the scalar field, uh, or the dynamical scalar field is even yet another scalar field, but basically a tensor field, a vector field, and a scalar field. Um, um, and this was their favorite uh, theory. But then um, what's going on here is that, so you have the Einstein metric, but that's not the space time that all the normal matter that these chairs and tables, et cetera, will experience. They will experience another uh, different metric, which is made up out of uh, the Einstein metric and this vector and scalar field. Uh, and in such a way that the, well, I don't want to call it light cones, but the causal structure, the conformal structure, basically the causal structure of the Einstein metric and uh, this physical metric are different. So long story short, what that means is that um, gravitational waves and light rays will, in this theory, will travel on different uh, PD6. So if there's a source that shoots out gravitational waves and light rays, then in general, they won't arrive at the Earth, uh, on Earth at the same time. Um, in this theory, whereas in GR, you would expect them to just follow the same total structure. Um, and then in 2017, we get the Newton star merger constraints. Uh, the era of gravitational wave astronomy starts. And we actually see gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation does basically arrive at the same time within experimental errors. So suddenly where you have theories with kind of two metrics, one experienced by gravitational waves and the, the normal matter lives in a different space time. Uh, well, they kind of really run into problems with that. But of course, theorists never give up. So um, the new favorite is relativistic Mond, which is a more complicated generalization of Peves, trying to well be a bit fine tuned to evolve, uh, to avoid these constraints. Um, they claim that they can solve all the problems, large scale, the, the, the new star merger, oh, merger constraints, and also the, the, the cosmological observables, um, but this is highly controversial. Uh, so this remains the problem that takes most of gravity theories, how to deal with these large scales, and they're really not great at it at all. And let me just also mention, there's also a small trend since, well, let's say 15 years ago, uh, of hybrid theories, which kind of combo combines somehow dark matter and modified gravity. It's a small trend, but I think it's philosophically very interesting. So the next lecture will be using these to uh, raise some conceptual slash philosophical questions. Um, okay. Um, yes, let me just show this one more time because now you know what Mont is. So, um, right, so um, at this, the workshop we organized two years ago, you see that modified gravity was also somewhat popular. But again, that's of course, philosophers work more on than physicists do. More than half the people here are philosophers, so it's not surprising that Mond is somewhat popular, but I just want to say, well, it's not, it's not zero, right? Uh, there are people working on it. And for lecture two, the hybrid theories, there were also uh, some people who think that's uh, interesting to look at. But yeah, don't take it too seriously, that slide. Okay, history, any questions about this uh, second, uh, historical narrative of modified gravity. Normally there's now lots of people disagreeing. Yeah. Is this paper by any mechanism or mechanism uh in 2016 he measured 
150 galaxies that they found the data that are more compatible with uh, mold than with the dark matter hypothesis. It's not in, in, in a fundamental moment in the history of mold. No. So, so, no, so this is Stacy McGaw uh, at Case Western yeah. University. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, um, no, they had been seeing this acceleration scale basically from the beginning. Um, but they do bring this up a lot. Well, what, yeah, so, um, I mean, there are many ways of choosing the right variables to plot this diagram, and then they find out the baryonic one. Well, there's a specific way of choosing it, which uh, makes the correlation as good as it's here. Uh, so they've been seeing the skills all over the time, but I um, mean, this is particularly good uh, observational work. And what, what they use this figure for often is the fact not just that it follows the line, but the fact is the residuals that it's really so, uh, where the scatter is so small that, well, few people would say that Mond is a law of nature, but as far as astronomy goes, right, it, it is possible that it really is a law of nature and not just some kind of correlation arriving from feedback mechanisms or what, what yeah. So it's important, the acceleration scale wasn't really new, but it's now really pointed down quite nicely. And the main thing you would say is, well, we'll come back to that later. How are you going to account in the documented paradigm, not only for the shape of the curve, but the very, very small scatter? Oh, no, I mean, no, I'm just saying it was kind of a culmination. It was not like, oh, bum, before that. So no, it's, it's important for them, but it was not like, a moment of time which was so different from what came before but it's a combination of the the direction they were going in anyway yeah so one thing that is kind of comes out to me when I'm going through all this history is that when you're looking at black scale or talking about mom in this kind of broad Newtonian sense it seems like the theory has been very fruitful um it's been really great at Unifying phenomena, maybe even making some predictions that we wouldn't have gotten at otherwise. But when you compare that to the relativistic case, it's it's such a dramatic difference between how fruitful the theories have been. And I was just curious if you know of any examples where with all the work that people have done developing these really complicated relativistic extensions have actually borne any kind of you know anything that we would say is kind of you know fruitful or um, useful in the way that um, Mon clearly seems to be um, when you look at galactic scales. Ah, uh, um, oh, good question. Um, I mean, there are, of course, lots of people modify gravity in lots of different contexts. Yeah, I don't know what, like, what comes to mind is using FR gravity, F of R, R gravity to account for dark energy. I don't know if that's. It's that because so I'm thinking specifically yeah. of the relativistic extensions that try to you know reproduce on not so oh not, 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 okay wait so the question is of if whether relativistic extensions and so relativistic theories with mont as the the limit whether they have been yeah is is that you know, it seems like when you're when you're comparing these these paradigms, the right level of it, which could be just would be at the relativistic level, just because you know, we're only looking at galaxies, we're also ignoring you know, solar system as we are, all the evidence we have for relativity and um mm -hmm. yeah, so I guess I was uh, trying to zoom in more on Yeah, yeah, I see, I see, yeah. Yeah, you're okay. Nice. You're picking up on loads of themes which are going to come back in the next lecture. So uh, that's great. Um, um, yeah, so what I find interesting, you're saying, right, what's the right level to compare them at? And I think that's uh, difficult to make that question precise in that you, if it, um, yes, you can say, well, the final theory or the, the full story will need to somehow be uh, the relativistic theory. So maybe that's the right level to look at. But then again, in all these cases, they will still have a certain limit, whether it's Newton or Mond, so that's still part of the theory. And that part of the theory is all you need for most of these galactic things. So in a way there, even if you don't yet have a favorite relativistic extension, if you know that all these relativistic extensions are gonna have Mond as your limit. And in that case, there's really nothing to be, for the data, you don't need any relativistic theory, then and say, well, uh, the Mondans will say, well, any relativistic extension will do, it just doesn't matter for that case. 
for that context. But then, of course, you're right, like at the large scale or at these, some of these gravitational lensing, obviously you need relativity um, and these other uh, observables as well. Um, so there, obviously, the right thing to do is compare those. And then, um, well, then, so, I mean, Tevis did quite well. The problem is this, and we'll get back to this in the third lecture, is at what cost? And if it just gets too complicated, if you just keep, right, but they, I mean, so yeah, this is all going to be in the third lecture where the Monians accuse dark matter theorists of, uh, that the theory is not falsifiable because it's quite, they say ad hoc, you put in, especially at the galactic scale, loads of parameters, you can fit whatever you want, like, so it couldn't even be false, which is funny because they throw the small scale challenges at them, say, you see, it is, and same time they say it's falsified and they're also accusing them of not being falsifiable. But anyway, let's say they're saying it's too complicated, you're adding too many parameters. Huh? But then as soon as you want to go beyond MONS and have a red risk theory, it's going to be more complex in terms of more fields, more parameters as well. So right, Tevis has the, the two extra fields and I think one non-dynamical scatter, scatter field and maybe another constant. And Armand is using that and making it even more complex. So David Spergel called it Baroque, it's basically Baroque dark matter. It's just, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so this ties into very interesting philosophical questions like it becomes less simple. So if you think theoretical virtues like simplicity matter, then, then even if Mond did very well, eventually these, these uh, theories lose, um, lose out anyway. It ties on with into issues of falsifiability. Um, and the issue of the second lecture is at some point, if Spergel says, well, Armand's basically Armand is basically Baroque dark matter. At which point can we can we still always distinguish dark matter and modified gravity? And I happen to be someone who thinks in some cases you cannot. Um, and then okay, and then the kind of that kind of dissolves the debate in a different way. Basically says, well, stop asking which one is better. You can't even distinguish the two in all cases. So yeah, okay, we we're going to get back to this. Lots of interesting, um, good questions. Um, let's see where were we. More questions about history of modified gravity. Yeah. So, is this, so this means the study of uh, axis black in matter, which ironically is the prediction of mathematical theory. Oh, yeah. Do you think that this is important by sort of the mathematical theory? Do you know if the most people have reactions? These are very early universe, right? Or? Yes, so the first response was that the distance measurements were wrong, but then they got more data that they really like to check one. Yeah. That's not which is observation. And I'm curious if people are going to want to really have this one. So there was no dark matter, but there was also a thing with galaxies which had many, basically only dark matter. But you're saying galaxies with galaxies without dark matter. Yeah. Um, um, I think I had a long email thread with someone about this and I'm trying to remember what we said. Um, I'm not sure what the details were of those case because if it's like the external field effect, Mond will predict that if the, in certain cases you will not expect phantom dark matter because of the, back, the external field, but this was a different case, right? Oh, great. Um, I, I need to look up the details again, but yeah, just in case. Any other questions? Okay, then I suggest we have a five minute break before I will talk about the other two parts of the uh, uh, lecture. Thank you. Uh, let's get started with the second half. Um, yes, yeah, so we did the history of both research programs. And now let's talk a bit more about philosophy. I'm a philosopher of physics. Um, okay, one more slide on history, but the history of philosophy. Um, so, we saw, right, dark matter, and the story started somewhere in the 1930s, uh, modified gravity in 1983. Um, and um, philosophy of dark matter is much more uh, recent uh, with uh, Bill Vandenberg, who I already mentioned, the first philosopher of dark matter uh, two decades ago, um, when he wrote a three thesis thesis and a few papers, and then later a few more papers. Didn't really gain a lot of momentum, but then the last five, six, seven years, we uh, see much more activity, or at least relative to the standards of the philosophy of science community. Um, and then we don't you know, only see dark matter, but also some philosophers working or physicists working on either the philosophy of Mond or the relationship between the dark matter and Mond communities. 
And we also have the first special issue in the philosophy of dark matter, which is also in the philosophy of Mond. Um, and I think in your reading folder, there's the editorial uh, for that special issue, which gives you an overview of some of the philosophical questions, which I think are interesting within the context of philosophy of dark matter, and which I'll show on the next few slides. But if you want to see them uh, at your own pace, you can read that editorial. And also in the last few years, we see more involvement of physicists, although some have complained that it's disproportionately so on the modified gravity side of things. Um, okay, so rather than just give you a list of 30, 40 questions, I try to group them a little bit. This is very coarse grained, don't take it too seriously, just um, write many questions will fall into multiple categories. But basically you have the semantic questions, which is the fancy uh, word for uh, the meaning. Right? We've saw the multiple dark matter concepts, what does dark matter mean? Um, etc. and more metaphysical questions. If Lang the CDM is right or Mond is right, what is the world like according to these theories? Then more descriptive questions, right? How uh, how did the, the history of dark matter evolve uh, or, or modified gravity evolve? How these communities relate to each other? What are the factors that play a role in their methodological choices? Um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we have the group of questions which is more like okay, like which are methodological flaws? Should things be done differently? How can we improve the methodology? Um, to what kind of knowledge do we get from these experiments? How trustworthy is the knowledge? How robust is it? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So more, these are somewhat more neutral questions and this is more, okay, uh, let's, uh, let's get involved and uh, see if we can uh, improve or criticize or um, the way things are done in this uh, context. Okay. So let me first uh, give you a bunch of semantic and metaphysical questions. Um, one is at this stage, given the current empirical data and theoretical developments, can we already be what philosophers call scientific realists about dark matter? I'll say more about that in lecture three, but uh, very, very briefly and simplified, that is, can we say dark matter exists? And unpacking that statement will be a lot of work, but very, very roughly, that's what it's all about. Um, right, given indeed the fact that we haven't yet seen the dark matter, part, dark matter particle, for instance. Um, yeah, um, we've already also seen could be multiple concepts of dark matter that are thrown around. Um, maybe different communities use the terms in different ways. Siska, who unfortunately couldn't yet make it due to the strikes at Bologna Airport, but should be here soon. In the second lecture, she'll say a bit about this. Um, and then also the question, how should we understand Mons, right? So is it a law of nature like Newton's law of universal gravitation? Well, as was just pointed out, well, uh, we need some metaphysic extension. So it's, this is maybe a bit too strong. Maybe it's just a kind of a constraint on whatever the final theory is, even if it's a dark matter theory. Maybe it's more of an algorithm, like you give me the baryonic stuff, I will tell you the gal galaxy rotation curve, right? It spits out galaxy rotation curves. Or maybe it's something else. So how should we look at this? What is the most fruitful way of looking at it for all communities involved? Um, and then what I hinted at, uh, one of the topics I've been working on is, okay, in all cases, for up to now, I've told you the history of dark matter, history of modified gravity, as if these are two separate things. Um, can you always need to separate them? Or do these concepts overlap or merge or are blurred in some contexts and uh, some theories? Uh, so I'll talk about that on Wednesday, I think. Um, then a bunch of more descriptive questions. One huge question is, okay, when you tell the story of dark matter and modified gravity in the past and also how it's developing now, which factors do you need to bring up when you tell the story? Obviously, the big one is the empirical data, right? Which is uh, the first half of the talk mentioned many of the observations and empirical constraints. Um, but often that's not the whole story. Often people bring up uh, theoretical virtues, uh, as I've said, uh, convergence arguments, right? Do multiple independent ways of getting a grip on dark matter and modified gravity, do they agree or not? Um, eliminative reasoning, reasoning, sometimes things are idealized. Are those always justified or in which context can we justify these idealizations? Um, whether physicists admit it or not, often guiding principles play an important role, like in particle physics, the naturalist principle, or Einstein's equivalence principle, or as we've seen in the what is it, 50s, 60s, when cosmologists came into play in this debate, there was a very strong like 
Is it a ratum for having more mass to close the universe? Uh, for me, basically because of mass principle or kind of a priori prejudices. Uh, so just talking about data, there wasn't a lot of data back then. Just data is not always telling the full story. And then many, many more factors, right? The Cold War, uh, other political factors, how is funding distributed? Um, uh, how do groups interact with each other from a psychological and social epistemology perspective? Lots of things going on. Uh, it's a huge question, and you see that's where much of the work um, on this topic has been done. Um, then I think one of the things that makes this an interesting topic, a bit like black hole thermodynamics, what we also see here is that lots of different fields come together, right? I mean, dark matter, and monofer gravity, but also within, for instance, dark matter, um, you have constraints coming from a huge range of skills, right? Cosmological skill, observational astronomy, and then since the 80s, the particle physicists come into play. So these things interact in interesting ways and as philosophers, but also as physicists and historians, that's a very rich um, interaction for us to unpack and comment on. And then a perennial philosophy of science topic is underdetermination. The some would say, well, what's going on here is that the data underdetermines whether dark matter is correct or not, or whether one of the one dark matter candidate or the other is correct. Is there really determination, underdetermination going on? If so, which type of undetermination? There are lots of different types. Philosophers have written on it, so they will have come up with many different types. And then how do we, if there is underdetermination, what's the best way of solving it? Or is there some empirical way of removing the undetermination? Do we need theoretical virtues? And if so, which ones? Um, and another bunch of the scripts questions are when we, I mean, the first one is similar to the first one on the previous slide. So when we are trying to tell this story of like matter and, and maybe also modified gravity is uh, how should we do that? So people like Melissa Jaycard and um, Michaela Massimi have said, we shouldn't understand in terms of theories, but in terms of models. Then there are, of course, the standard big names in philosophy of science, maybe should understand in terms of Popper's falsificationism or Kuhnian paradigms. I think someone mentioned the word paradigms at some point. Maybe a Lakatosian research program story is a better way of understanding what's going on and how the field develops. Loudon's research traditions, Fire Evans pluralism, or, and I think Siska will talk about this, non-empirical theory confirmation. And I will say a bit about trading zones, which is a technical term, uh, which I'll talk about more. Um, yes, so what's, from a, like if you put on our philosophy goggles, uh, how should we understand how these uh, groups, fields develop and interact and decide how to move on and uh, to abandon things, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, another question, I mean, kind of related is um, what the dark matter searches I mentioned, right? Direct detection, indirect detection, many of the other speakers will say more about this. Um, what are these methodologies? What's really, what's the, the reasoning, the logic behind such? Is it eliminative reasoning or something else? And Cisco will have a lot to say about it in lecture two and our other speakers will have a lot to say that about that as well, I imagine. Um, then kind of a fun topic uh, with Jack de Swart and uh, Henri Moll, who is an anthropologist I think are working on is that um, for these dark matter detectors to work, they need to be extremely, extremely clean, right? Where you need many, many postdocs spending a lot of time on figuring out how to properly clean things, uh, which I guess, especially historians and anthropologists find a fascinating topic to, to, to discuss. Um, and then there's the question, I never know if it's a good question to ask or not, but there's definitely a different vibe in particle physics compared to say gravitational wave physics. Is dark matter physics currently in a crisis or is it doing exactly what's supposed to be happening? Is it normal science in the Kuhnian sense? Is the fact that we haven't yet found a dark matter particle, that's just how science is developed and we're doing everything in the right way? Or yeah, uh, so you could ask that question. And I think Siska will touch upon this in her final lecture. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I will say much about it. Um, and then the third category of questions are more normative, right? What should be happening? What's going on methodologically? How can it be improved? Um, one question, should any time, effort, intellect, capital, resources be spent on the modified gravity research program at all? This guy, Nora, I think the answer is no. Um, the next question is, well, uh, should we always focus only on one research program or is it fine to just have division of labor? Um, 
And a question which I always think is fun to ask physicists, although they don't think it's fun when I ask them, is uh, if they, they could imagine anything that happens in the next 10, 20, 30 years that would make them abandon the dark matter hypothesis or whether it's basically well, unfalsifiable or whether it's uh, basically, uh, yeah, nothing could make them change their mind. Um, so maybe we can ask some physicists here uh, sometime this week. Um, another topic uh, is if you look at these research programs or specific candidates, um, right, philosophers like to talk about explanation. Some philosophers think it's not physics, science is not just about descriptions, about uh, connecting very observables with other observables, it's also telling an explanatory story and then what explanation means. Well, there's a lot of, lot of different philosophical accounts. Um, so what I've been doing with uh, Martin King, um, well, I'll talk about that in the third lecture. We look at the explanatory stories or the types of explanation that feature in these research programs. And then uh, lots of simulations, including dark matter simulations is very much a growing field. And they can ask, okay, what's the epistemic status? Where epistemic is, is the fancy word for uh, study of knowledge. Um, Right, so do these simulations give us knowledge? What kind of knowledge? How trustworthy, how reliable is this knowledge? And do these, are they more like black boxes or they, do they give us a good explanatory story? And if so, what type? Um, and Siska will also talk about this in text two and three. And what I already mentioned, the question as well, is dark matter falsifiable or is non falsifiable? You can also ask. And Siska will also talk about this, I think tomorrow. Um, Okay, a few more, and then I'm done with this long list. Um, some people might say, well, I think, what is it, 27, 28% of the universe is dark matter, uh, but we can't see it. Maybe a bit strange to think, just like with black holes, a bit strange to talk about this thing where we almost by definition can see in some sense of seeing. Um, some might say this means dark matter and be investigating dark matter means that epistemologically speaking, in terms of the knowledge we can get is very different, like qualitatively distinct from um, other entities we study in science. And others will say, no, this is the run of the mill as astronomy, uh, astrophysics. Uh, this is nothing special, or at least maybe a difference of degree a little bit, uh, but no difference in kind. This is just very, very uh, mainstream uh, astronomy. Um, another, Right, so the topic of the summer school is philosophy of dark matter, not dark energy, although dark energy is the obvious other big mysterious entity, 68% right now in our universe. Usually these topics are indeed, right, it's not surprising that this is not about dark energy. Usually these topics are very much, right, different communities working on them. Uh, but nonetheless, they're kind of two of the, the main dark entities, things around. Uh, is it the right way to go to explore them independently or are there links there? Um, and another question is, let's say we get lucky and tomorrow, or maybe already we haven't heard, maybe the, there will be a press announcement later that uh, we have found a dark matter particle candidate, say at the, the LHC or one of the direct detection experiments. Well, okay, let's say at the, the, the LHC. And then the question is, if we find a candidate there, does that mean we can say, yes, we have found the cosmic dark matter? Um, I mean, of course, this would be great news, but I don't think we're necessarily already there yet, right? For instance, um, you're not going to, you measure it at, or if we find such a candidate, you infer it by saying, oh, there's missing energy, right? It's dark. You can see directly, detect it directly. There's missing energy in a collider. So we infer there's dark matter. Um, now, this is, is um, the time frame is very, very small. So to say, okay, we found a dark matter candidate to then infer this is something that lives over cosmic, or lives, or that's around in cosmic uh, time scales. Well, that's, that's, that's another step, right? Um, and also, if you find it at your collider, that doesn't mean you already know that the cosmic density that it's exactly that it's in our cosmos in the exactly the right amounts that we needed to account for all these well the first 30 slides of the presentation um so of course this would be an amazing first step but then you would want to check okay now we know hopefully what its ma mass and cross section is now we're going to then go to the cosmos and see okay do we also find the thing we created in uh, well a very big lab effectively uh, do we also find it out there in the cosmos with the right uh, life uh, like is it as stable as it needs to be and in the right density um, and then finally, um, uh, you can ask maybe, well, as I will argue later, I think it would be good for all these communities, dark matter, modified gravity, and also the philosophers who work on these topics, historians, sociologists, anthropologists, to be more integrated than they, than they 
well, definitely were 20 years ago. It's improving now. And are there good ways of going about that? I mean, the summer school is one good way of doing it, I imagine. Um, but uh, there may be uh, other ways. Uh, so we can talk about that. I'll touch upon this in, well, actually in all the other lectures. Okay, so that was a long list. Um, you can uh, read it in your own time in editorial, which I think is on the team drive. Uh, it's editorial for the special issue on dark matter and modified gravity with a bunch of papers from physicists and Siska and Nora's papers in there and some more papers. And then we get to the final part. Yes, bridging the divide between the dark matter and modified gravity communities. Um, yeah, so I hesitated also a bit to show this picture because it's very, very preliminary. But again, I think it might be good, uh, especially if you're not, right? It can be, it's such a big field dark matter. It can be difficult to kind of get an overview, like you hear a term here, primordial black holes there. You don't know, is this something which a few people work on or is this a huge, uh, or do lots of people work on it? Uh, so to give you some kind of rough first impression of uh, what the field is like, at least between 2017 and 2022, is we did a uh, co-citation analysis. So basically what you what you do, what we did is look at all the papers which have dark matter or mont or something similar in the title of abstract between those in those five years. And then, um, but it's not those papers which are nodes in this network. But what one typically does here is that you then look at the bibliographies of all those papers and the authors in there are plotted here. Those are the nodes and they're connected if they appear in the same bibliography. That's kind of the norm these days in these co-citation analysis because that's supposed to give the best kind of overview or understanding of the various communities, right? So you see here that kind of, what is it? Five sub-communities emerge in the sense of that within a the community, there's much more connections than between the communities. And again, this is how to interpret these communities is preliminary because I have not yet gone through all the thousands of papers. Uh, uh, but it seems like the big one here is kind of the particle dark matter people, or at least the fermionic ones. Uh, right, whereas the, the axions, etc., seems like that's the red uh, bunch over here. And we here have the big scale, the co observational cosmology, cosmologists, and these are more observational astronomers, it seems, right, the galactic regime, which we've had, uh, talked about quite a bit. And then Mont is uh, here. Here is Milgram and Saunders and Mago and some of the other Mondian, Mondians. Um, so this is somewhat of an overview of the communities, very uh, preliminary. Uh, so the first question you might ask is, okay, Mont is um, quite small. Why even talk about it? Well, of course, if you compare it to all dark matter communities uh, together, it's of course um, uh, indeed quite small. But at the same time, dark matter consists of many, many sub-communities, right? If you look at primordial black holes or fuzzy dark matter, these are also small, uh, right? Small compared to all of dark matter together. Um, so yeah, this is many, many different small groups and you could look at any of them. And part of these lectures will also be about um, um, MONT, which uh, yeah, as we'll see, I think it's particularly because it's supposed to be different from all the dark matter ones, because it's a modification of a law rather than postulating more matter. I think uh, there's a lot of, um, as we also saw on the previous slides, a very philosophically rich topic to compare and contrast the theories, but also the people working on them, how they uh, uh, approach these things. Um, yes, because basically, even if you think dark matter is the way to go, I still think it's an interesting question to ask yourself then, okay, but why is Mond not understood as a theory or a law of nature or something, but just as an algorithm that spits out galactic rotation curves and galactic correlations if you input the visible matter, why does it get any predictions right? Why, if there's dark matter, is it such that somehow at the galactic scale, you can reformulate it as a theory of gravity? That seems something surprising. Uh, I think that's a fun question to ask. It's usually asked by Mondians, um, which maybe are not the best people to ask, because uh, yeah, uh, to ask that question in the sense that that maybe makes it less likely that dark matter advocates um, respond to the question. Um, but if you forget about who asks it, I think it's an interesting question, okay. Well, uh, why is getting anything right at all, even though it's highly problematic at larger scales and the relativistic domains? Um, this also connects to uh, the paper by Siska and Nora, and Siska will discuss this in more detail. But right, so there the question 
she's asking is what should we do now? We have the small skills challenges. Does that mean we should jump uh, out of the dark matter ship or modify it, maybe going to self-interacting dark matter or warm dark matter? Uh, or, oh, sorry, I said that wrong. Yeah, uh, so uh, modify gravity or something else. Uh, modify uh, the standard dark matter, go to something more exotic within the dark matter paradigm regime uh, research program, or we should just going as we are. Um, and they argue for the last option. Um, she will talk about this in her third lecture. Um, and I'm very sympathetic to that in the sense that I think dark matter physicists working on the galactic regime should very much continue what they're doing and look at all the it's called gastrophysics, right? The supernovae, the feedback of all the um, uh, gas, etc. cetera. Um, because these things are gonna play a role. So we better get as good a grip on them as possible. Um, I mean, Imanis will say, uh, yeah, maybe let me just also connect it back to one of the earlier questions where, right, we saw the small scatter of the MDAR. Um, what, what Siska Nora will say is like, well, look, we don't yet know the, all the gastrophysics. We need to work that out anyway. That's very complicated, very messy. Let's keep doing that because we need to figure that out anyway. And I agree, but the Monians will say, well, you're basically saying we don't yet have the right answers to the galactic scale. We have all these forecast problems, missing satellites problems, because there's all the messy gastrophysics, which we yet haven't yet taken into account. But for the specific case of the low scatter of the MDAR, the whole point there is that it's very neat correlation with no scatter. So saying, well, the solution is gonna be add more parameters and more messy stuff, then in 10 years, we'll figure it out. Qualitatively speaking, that doesn't seem the right way to go for that specific uh, claim that the monies are making. But of course, it might uh, well be the way to go for many of the other galactic observables. Anyway, but uh, so yes, dark matter physics work on this should definitely keep going in that direction. However, one thing I do want to question in their paper is the implicit assumption that you have to pick a research program. They seem to be saying, either we stick with dark matter or we stick with it modified a bit, or we go for modified gravity, it's one or the other. If you're one single person, okay, maybe, but we have many people working and I don't see why we have to necessarily pick one or the other, why some funding can go to both and whether that's 90, 10%, 50, 50 I don't say it should be 50, 50, but um, um, principle, you could uh, go for multiple research programs as long as each of them has something to offer. Um, yeah, so quickly coming back to this picture, right? So not just about the size, also, um, Well, yeah. Um, wait, but so this is the papers were 2017 to 22, but what's pictured here is the bibliographies in these papers. So in the bibliographies, of course, you can go way and way back, right? So in that sense, it is kind of uh, goes back further in the past. So you can kind of talk about how the communities are, yeah, how the communities relate, but indeed, from this picture to tell you how popular one that's more and more tricky because of the way the consultation analysis is done. But yeah, I see how that uh, would be misleading. Um, yeah, but yeah. I mean, we also, I've now forget what, it, we also have them for different time frames, and you could look at how the communities change in size over time. I don't remember from the top of my mind um, how the size of the action one evolves over time. But yeah, we are very much working on this project. So that's gonna take, uh, quite a bit more time. Um, what was I saying? Um, ah, yes, so, although what I'll be saying in lecture two and three, I think is interesting for intrinsic reasons. One way, one additional way, an overarching way of being interested in all these topics, it was I think they help us understand the relationship between all the dark matter communities on one hand and the Mont community or on communities. Um, on the other hand, because although it doesn't show up here, because it just seems like the monians are absorbed by the observational astronomers, uh, that's actually surprised us because we would have expected Mon to be much more isolated. Because other than in terms of co-citation, these communities seem to be very much divided and isolated from one another. And right, obviously, you know, the dark matter one is by far the biggest one. And then we have the smaller uh, modified gravity rebels. And in many ways, there's a real divide uh, between these groups. They, uh, uh, well, Peter Gallison called this in trading zone. I'll come back to that in a second. And basically, it means 
there's not too much communication between them and the communication that's there is very intense, polemic. Uh, it's not, not particularly fruitful, very emotional on both sides, a lot of frustration. Uh, people think the other side is not listening, don't want to spend time on trying to explain what they mean to the other side. Um, some of them will, on both sides, will talk about dark matter modified gravity as different paradigms, I guess in the Kuhnian sense. Uh, I'm not sure I agree, but anyway, that's how they sometimes talk about it, the physicists themselves and accuse the other side of being extremely dogmatic, um, which is probably correct, but also for their own side. Um, and um, what I think it's interesting that both sides really, I mean, they're not using the terms winners and losers, but it seems their frame it is very much as the only way this can end or is already now is that one of them is gonna be completely right and the other one is gonna be completely wrong. Like this can only be the, they want to win, of course, and it must be that the other lose. There's no way both of them can be right about part of the story, in some sense, and that's what I'll be talking about in the second talking about in the second lecture. But of course, well, um, first of all, to make this claim, you need to say, well, these these approaches really are distinct, and then you may need to make the further claim that one approach really is 100% successful, and the other approach is 0% successful. Um, but already at that first claim, whether they, you can really strictly divide the two approaches, that's already where one can push back, which I'll do later. Um, it was basically, uh, I guess, as opposed to Siska and Nora's paper, uh, I like I like what Raul says on this matter, or in retrospect, uh, right? So he says, there are different sorts of conflicts between theories. One familiar kind of conflict is that in which two or more theorists offer rival solutions of the same problem. In the simplest cases, their solutions are rivals in the sense that if one of them is true, the others are false. More often, naturally, the issue is, issue is a fairly confused one in which each of the solutions proffered is in part right, in part wrong, in part just incomplete or nebulous. There's nothing to regret in the existence of disagreements of this sort, even if in the end, all the rival theories but one are totally demolished, still their contest has helped to test and develop the power of the arguments in favor of the survivor, right? So even if you think there's, there's less than 1% chance that either dark matter or Mont is right, let's say that, that Mont is right, then you might still think it's good to, if there's some funding, some effort into Mont, that the Monians push the dark matter to ask this question, how, oh, why does the Monon algorithm get something right at the level of galaxies, right? To, to keep everyone uh, sharp. Um, that's way, one, of, one way of looking at it. I want to, I think, needs to be a bit more subtle than that because if it's really just two rivals who don't really talk to each other, then that's not the most, the best way of making progress, right? The way they are actually gonna help each other or improve the other program is if they, right, communicate and share tools, share methods, uh, right? If they just coexist next to each other in isolation, it's not obvious that that is necessarily by itself going to improve uh, the progress of science. So I think one thing to add to that is that you would want to be some sort of progress, which Peter Gaddison calls a training zone, right? So, um, let's see. yeah. So, there are many different stories being told by philosophers about how science makes progress or whether it makes progress at all. Right? So, the logical positivist said, well, the language of science is that of observation and it keeps on growing. We just have observations and it keeps growing, and that's how science progresses. It's an empirical language which grows and grows and grows. Now we get the anti-positivists who are like, no, no, no. The language of science is theory. It's not about um, not empirical. It's about theory. And then it seems like we have a problem because we have Newtonian physics, GR, etc. It seems we have the discontinuities, radical revolutions, where theory changes completely, tells us a different story of the world. So then it seems this language is, I mean, if you go the Kuhnian route and say it's really commensurable, these different paradigms can commute. Uh, communicate with each other, then uh, like within a period of normal science, you build up your, your language of science, the theory, and then bam, everything stops, you start all over again, and then progress seems a bit tricky. That's how you understand science. And Peter Gallison, uh, who's an historian says, story, slash uh, historian and philosopher of science, says, forget about what's the language of science. The, the core of science is all the communities that are involved, right? And that can be experimentalists, theorists, instrumentalists, and then different kinds of theorists, etc. cetera. Um, these kind of form like a honeycomb, a web of all these of different communities. And they're kind of 
glued together by what he calls trading zones. Um, where they kind of come together, these communities, and they don't have one global language, they all don't all speak the same language, but they still come together and have kind of local, a local language, local way of communicating with each other, so they can create like solutions, tools, etc. Right. So one paradigmatic example is supposed to be Feynman diagrams, the little, the little diagrams, where if you show that to an experimentalist or a theorist, might mean something very different to them, but still they can come together and write down the symbols and talk to each other and then uh, talk to each other how they should build an LHC or uh, something like that, right? Just like, I mean, this, this term comes from anthropology. So peoples can meet and change stuff. They don't have to agree on the value or even interpretation of what they are trading, as long as they agree, agree on how much, how much of one stuff they're gonna uh, trade with how much of some other stuff. And if they can do that, then uh, trade can happen. Similarly, Gallison says, Gallison says, well, what you need is, right? So the problem with anti is was like, if there's a radical revolution and science kind of stops, we need to start all over again. But if you have all these different communities, then if one community has a revolution, that's not really a problem as long as there's a tight web of all these other communities that together they're tight enough to progress overall. But then for them to be tight enough, they need to communicate in some sense, even if they don't fully speak the same language. Um, yeah, so, and the problem with that, so, I would say it's great to have some people, perhaps the majority of people working on dark matter, some people working on modified gravity. Um, and if there would be a trading zone between them, that they uh, communicate, use tools from, uh, from the other side, right? Maybe if you think, well, Mond is definitely not the right theory, use it as an algorithm to uh, analyze your data or understand what's going on galactic, um, in the galactic regime. Um, yes. so. It seems yeah, so. One of the kind of the background questions for my next two lectures is why is there barely any trading zone? Why are these communities really isolated from each other? And um, why is their communication so uh, polemic and intense? And then the question well, if you find out these reasons, you can ask are these good reasons? Are they bad reasons? Could history have gone completely differently? Um, or could we now in the future bring these communities? closer to one another because maybe they have much more common ground than they actually think they have and and i at least would think that uh, that would be better for this part uh, part of science um the monians have seems like maybe they've tried once in a while half in somewhat half-baked way to uh try to build up this trading zone right so even at the very beginning uh, Moti Milgram himself, when he introduced uh, Mont, wasn't necessarily wasn't saying, "Oh, this is a law of nature." He called it an effective working formula, right? Um, uh, yeah, some basic assumptions. Uh, yeah, um, but then he also kind of so this sounds sounds nice. Maybe dark matter advocates can do something with this. But then kind of he also has statements like goes through lots of different um, kind of mechanisms that could underlie Mont many of which I seem like dark matter to me, but anyway, but he then also completely makes it, but it's not dark matter, it's not dark matter. I'm not telling you, like I'm not insisting it's a law of nature, but but it's definitely not dark matter. I'm not sure exactly what those reasons for it are supposed to be. So it seems they're kind of um, being constructive here towards opposing uh, research programs, but at the same time, they're also very set on it not being what their opponents think it is. Um, but yeah, the typical story, the typically way Mondes, uh in popular media is, is portrayed as yeah there's a modification of newton's it's a new it's a modification of newton's force it's a force it's a theory it's a little thing yeah yeah um but some of the other prominent figures like uh, saunas and go they uh, in the last two decades have sometimes talk about more as an algorithm right so they're not phrasing that, framing it as a theory or just saying it's an algorithm a nice way of connecting some observables to other observables it seems to work very well just understood in that very neutral mathematical or yeah, neutral uh, algorithmic way. Um, but that at the same time, in many other places, they will also stamp their foot and say, it's definitely not mark, uh, dark matter. It's, it's a different paradigm. Uh, so of course, that's not really helping in bringing uh, these groups uh, in the same room to talk to each other. So I think I'm almost done. Um, but let me set up. So basically, when it comes to understanding the relationship between uh, uh, 
dark matter advocates and mont advocates. I think if you've ever been in a room with both of them, you might recognize the way we might see it here this week. Um, that, yeah, it can be quite intense. Now, obviously, part of the story is just empirical data. Obviously, when we're doing science, very important part of the story. But um, principle, everyone has access to that same data, and there are very intelligent people on both sides of the, the research program, and still they're not at all agreeing. Um, so it doesn't seem like that can be the full story. Also, sometimes, when I mean, you never see this in, in publication, but at conferences, people say, but okay, yes, maybe Mont or maybe Dark Matter can account for like 10% of the data, but my research program, 90%, but how do you quantify how much, how much data? It's very hard to can really uh, say that. So, and of course, eventually your theory will want to account for all of these data. So, of course, data is very crucial, uh, but it doesn't seem to uh, resolve the issue. Um, I would, I uh, my hypothesis would be that there's also some extent, I don't know, social factors or depends a bit on which department you grow up. It seems like um, the papers I've read myself without yet using these tools, where it's more like the Mondians happen to have grown up in an observational astronomy department. And if you grow up uh, in a relativity department or a particle physics department, you're basically going to end up being a dark matter advocate. Uh, so we want to see if, yeah, to what extent these factors determine uh, which research program you are going to end up advocating. Um, so what we've, the papers we've read ourselves, that seems to be the case. So we now want to under, uh, investigate that more systematically uh, with the digital humanities tools. It's kind of a recent school within philosophy, which uses uh, uh, various tools like the co-citation as I showed you, right? Use, go through the whole corpus of dark matter and modified gravity papers and use various techniques to quantify um, the relationships between these, uh, you know, between the people involved, the relationships between departments, relationships between journals, relationship between conferences they talk at, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that might be part of the story. And then there are two parts which I'll focus on. I think one big part is, is there really a strict dichotomy uh, between dark matter and modified gravity? Is really the case that if you postulate a new quantum field, it has to be either a dark matter field without being a modification of the gravitational field, or it is a modification of the gravitational field, but cannot at the same time be a, a dark matter field. Um, uh, whereas, this, yeah. Um, and um, I think you cannot always make the case that, is, that it's that black and white. So we'll be looking at hybrid theories where the distinction kind of gets blurred. And at that point, uh, right? If that's the case, then holding on to, oh, dark matter must win or Mont must win, if they can kind of, kind of overlap in some sense, that, 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 well, that should maybe, I hope that it will kind of resolve the tension to some extent um, and make a practitioner see that, at least in some context, they're more close to one another than they uh, might have thought. Um, yeah. And then I think the fourth part of the story is that it seems like different theoretical virtues are invoked by the different communities, specifically when it comes to what counts as a good explanation. Uh, and we'll argue in the last lecture and work with Martin King is that the dark matter camp seems to favor stories, explanations that unify things, right? That unify, right? Postulate that type of dark matter, it solves six problems at once. That's a very, uh, those kind of stories are really loved by dark matter advocates, whereas the Mondians keep going on about simplicity. We have fewer parameters, that, that makes for a good explanation, that means we're more falsifiable. Great, this is the way to go. Mont only has one parameter. Yes, simplicity, we're simple, simple is good. Um, so that's what seems to be going on. So then uh, a few questions you can ask. One is like, is one, first of all, you can ask, does this matter at all? This is kind of, is this not just subjective? Uh, if there's just a matter of taste, then maybe they should not be disagreeing that much because they really only disagree about the taste. Or maybe say, maybe there's something objective to it and you can ask, okay, well, which of these is the way the more important one, or maybe they're both important. And then you can ask, okay, is dark matter as unifying as dark matter advocates say it is? And is it not also simple in some respects? And is modified gravity as simple as uh, modern advocates say? And maybe modified gravity is also unif uh, unificatory to some extent. Uh, so we'll talk about in the third lecture, I think again, there's many, many reasons why different theoretical 
virtues are not a good justification for these groups being apart. They're actually much, much closer together than they think. Uh, so perhaps um, in an ideal world, that would remove some of the, uh, remove a further obstacle between these two uh, competing research paradigms, um, research programs. So that's basically uh, all I had to say for today. So that was the introduction. On Wednesday, I think we'll talk about hybrid theories and what is dark matter, what is modified gravity, are they mutually exclusive? And then the third week, talk about can we already be dark matter realists or is it too early? And what do both camps mean by an explanation and are they as good as explaining things as they think they are? Um, any questions? Mm -hmm. I have one question, but I think it was like important for the one something like that. Uh, when you listed all these uh, different questions, the last slide of question, yes, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the very first one here, the indirect observation of dark matter. But isn't that a thing having many different fields of physics? And that uh, does Davos be taking it as a liberal or uh, yeah, realistic interpretation? Looking at, for example, neutrino is the only fact by their bivalent um, interaction with matter and not by themselves uh, as like a particle set of the or something like that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So there are basically two camps and I'll discuss this in the third lecture. So people like Ian Hacking will. Yeah. So, I mean, you can ask this question without talking about realism, but you can also connect it to realism. And Ian Hacking connected it to realism. And he says, well, if you want to um, uh, think that some entity claim that some entity is real, you need to be able to experiment with it. You need to be able to spray it. Um, so anything in astronomy, you can do experiments. Arguably. Um, so he would say nothing, uh, yeah, it's not a specific thing about dark matter, anything in um, uh, astronomy, because you can do, because it's an observational or historical science rather than experimental science, you can be scientific reason about that. Um, um, yeah, about that. Interestingly, he then uses the case study of gravitational lenses, which are, I wouldn't say your tip, those are kind of more invisible than a star. Yeah, I think, yeah. And I wonder, like, is he really going to be an anti-realist about the sun? But anyway, but um, yeah, so you can go that way and have those kind of overarching, very universal reasons for uh, for saying you can be realistic about any of these things. Or you say, well, uh, whenever we do any observations in any field, but also astronomy, there's so many inferences you make uh, in the chain of inferences. I mean, different people make it in different ways. So counting how long that chain of inferences is, can be done in an objective way anyway. And maybe if, uh, yeah, uh, Melissa Jacob talks about uh, galaxies that are fully dark matter. So then you kind of need to indirectly observe them by them colliding with other galaxies and creating this called, well, a certain ring like features. Is it, yeah, maybe there's a, one more chain in the uh, chain of inference, uh, one more inference in the chain of inferences that make, yeah, that doesn't make it maybe a little bit more indirect, but that's nothing, nothing radical. Uh, so yeah, the, those two schools of thought and yeah. Mm -hmm. One comment. <laughs> yes. I would not say that there is, you are presenting the total solution as a kind of a thematic uh, dichotomy. Okay. okay. I've tried not to, but I see what you mean. Yes. Well, there is a big issue because we don't know the galaxy information. And so, also, some phenomenology that are low, because, for example, the galaxy low can be related to the, the formation progress and see it's hidden in the formation progress. Yeah. Uh, and then there is another symmetry um, between the two. Yes, yes, yes. It's the fact that the particle solution is still falsified. We are building the deck of bigger, bigger and bigger, expensive, more expensive, and we don't know how, when this. Uh, is, <laughs> is, is, is that you yes. Okay. It was like, for example, the moon landing in the, the 60s, you know, at the beginning it was easier, but then we stopped to do the space program, and uh, we are still waiting for the first man on Mars because it's the gap is becoming. Very, very big at the moment. We don't have the money and the technology for doing this. Mm -hmm. Probably it would be the same for the direct sector of that matter because if you're the detector, it becomes too expensive and 
information rules uh, interest in this. So yeah, <laughs> this is uh, instead okay for the for the uh, modification of reality. We don't know how to test this. I see. So okay. So let me start with the second half of the what you um, uh, just said. Yeah. So depends on whether you're saying that in the context of um, is Mont the right theory, or should we spend any time on Mont at all? Because if you're saying, well, um, yes, with dark matter, lots of other places to search, but the Mont will say the fact that we haven't found anything is because there is nothing yet. So we should at least have some funding to, but this is exactly what we predict. Our prediction has borne out so far. Yes, there's 90 order of magnitudes where we can still search. It's going to be very expensive. Give us at least a bit of money because we explain, we, 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 we predict that you wouldn't find a particle because it's, it's modified gravity. So what you just said, I don't think that's, uh, I think what you said, yes, it definitely means we can't say Mons is the right thing, is the, is the winner or the right thing to go. But I do think it gives us some reason to say, well, more than 0% of funding should go to Mons. Sorry, there. In the range for the, the, the final solution, they are different. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So I've tried to, that's why I did show the, uh, the where is it, oh, the, the consultation analysis, et cetera. So yeah, it, it is, yeah, obviously there are way more people working on dark matter, et cetera. So the first half of what you uh, said, right, is uh, much more work to do in the galactic scale from a dark matter perspective. Uh, who knows what's going to board, they might solve all these these small scale challenges. Yeah, so this is exactly what Cisco will be talking about. Indeed, how do we, uh, is this is normal science? Should we progress as we have been doing or should the dark matter physicists progress as they have been doing? And um, well, yes, I think they should, but um, depends on which observable you're looking at. I'm not gonna repeat myself, but um, um, when it comes to the small scatter, I don't know how much more gas physics is going to solve that problem because adding more messy stuff, the, the problem is finding something that's very neat. So adding more messy stuff, I'm not sure that's going to, I don't see how that uh, would solve the problem. But indeed, yeah, baritonic uh, baryonic tully fisher relationship. I know there are indeed uh, authors who say, well, we can account for um, the, the exponent, right, to the power four. Um, and then you get kind of into philosophical issues. Okay, if you can find one simulation or model that's consistent with it, is that as good as Mont giving a unique prediction? Then you need to talk about, well, many of these philosophical questions like, um, right, because uh, I'll also talk about that in the, the second lecture where, I mean, that's exactly what the Montians say, the, the dark matter people, yeah, add more parameters, you can eventually fit whatever you want, but that's not, well, I don't know if I want to say scientific, but I would say that's not as epistemologically preferable as to, to what they are doing, um, right? So it depends how they're going to proceed. If the, the way of proceeding is just adding more and more epicycles, more and more parameters, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure they're going to solve it, it's, right? Like how many parameters are going to be okay? Actually, I'll talk about this in the third lecture where I don't think all of this is a matter of taste because in some cases, I think there's some work on how you can quantify that more parameters actually reduce the likelihood of something being true because you're starting to correct for, for your you're starting to fit your experimental errors rather than the true curve. But that's a story I'll have to tell in, uh, on Thursday. Uh, but yeah, I think it's exactly there where the philosophical questions come in. Like, okay, if they can find some model that's consistent, sure, but is that success or is it success in the same way as the Monians claim they are successful and are the monuments as successful as they claim they are in the small context where they claim they are successful? But uh, but yes, I'm aware that there are very different views on on this. Yeah. <laughs>